So I'm delighted today to welcome to my right Trisha Petruni, who's with FHI 360, Jason Bremner, who's with Family Planning 2020, which is housed at the UN Foundation, and to my far left, Melissa Victor, who's with the Consultative Group to Assist the Poor, which is housed at the World Bank. And today we're talking about the evidence base for integration, so of course I'm going to start with Trisha Petruni, who's done more than I think anybody in this world, maybe in this room, maybe more than anyone in the world to understand the evidence base for integration. And Trisha, let's start with a fundamental question about evidence. What exactly do we want to know about integrated development? What are our expectations? What kind of information are we actually looking for? Yeah, great. Thanks, Lee. Um, so I really appreciate that we're able to start off this conversation about evidence today with the question about questions, so to be a little bit meta there. Um, when Ben was sharing some quotes this morning, actually one came to me from Einstein who said, if he had an hour to solve a problem that his life depended on, he would spend the first 55 minutes of that hour coming up with the right question and then he would have five minutes to answer it. So I just, I, I, my job at FHI 360 is I'm a technical advisor for our integrated development group. And so I spend a lot of time reading and trying to understand what evidence is out there about integration. So I get the question a lot, what does the evidence say? And that is what this panel is about. But I think it's, um, it's too much of a leap to dive right into what are the results, what do studies show you without thinking a little bit about what are we even trying to figure out? Why are we pursuing integration? So what would we actually look to the evidence base to tell us in the first place? So that's why I wanted to just share two points about that to kind of get us started for that today and what our appetites for, I think, what we hope to see in the evidence and if it's there or if it's not, and it'll probably be, be mixed. So the two points are, first, you know, integration is certainly not a goal. It's a means to an end. It's one possible means to an end. I don't think anyone is interested in pursuing integration for the sake of doing it. You have a reason for doing it. It's a vehicle or a process to get you somewhere better that you want to go. So I think when we're trying to find evidence about integration, it just, it, it's common sense, but we have to keep that front of mind that it's not the objective itself is are we integrating? It's is that integrating doing X, Y, or Z? And then the second point is that because it is a means to an end, um, there are very, there's a wide diversity in the, the manifestations of that means. So if we're channeling Einstein, we're trying to ask the right question, I just want to sort of start us off for the day saying, if we're asking what the evidence says, does, does, it, does it work when we're talking about integration, I think that's a flawed question. I think it's a fundamentally flawed question, so for two reasons. We can't answer that question, does it work? Because there's two problems in there. One is the it. The, that it is huge when you're talking about integration. It's one thing if you say, Leith, you know, does vitamin A work? Or do ARVs for HIV work? Like, those are really straightforward, narrow clinical questions that you can find some evidence and answer. When we're talking about does it, meaning integration, work, it's not that simple. So if I handed you you know, hypothetically, a really nice, you know, gold standard forearm randomized evaluation showing that this agriculture program that integrated with environmental conservation really worked. They produced amplified effects, there was value add, that's great. It doesn't answer the does it work question for someone who's trying to integrate something completely different, say family planning into microfinance or something. So when we're saying, what does the evidence say, does integration work, we have to say, what is the it? We have to be a little bit more comfortable with the uncomfortable nuance that I think brings, it comes into the question. And then the second piece of that is the word work. So if you define your it, does it work, let's say it's microfinance and family planning, what does work mean? Like, what does that mean? What do you want the evidence to show that it actually did? I think a lot of you in the room hearing that probably just had something pop into your mind already. Like, you know what you think you would pursue integration for. You know what maybe your goal is. But I guarantee you it's probably not the same one as the person sitting next to you, even though you think that it is. I hear from a lot of people different reasons why they're pursuing integration, and they're not the same. So does it work? Work means lots of different things to different people, and they're all important, and we need evidence to fill in all of those. So just to wrap up, I wanted to share some of our ideas at FHI 360 about what we do think that work means and what we want to dig into the evidence for in the first place. So there's seven dimensions of what we think integration can do, and it's going to be totally different depending on your priority, your perspectives, your values, your job, your objective. 
But so these are just examples. But one that I like to start off with is satisfaction. So do people actually like integration? That is a pursuit in and of itself for a lot of groups, especially advocacy groups. They want people to be happier with the services that they get. So you could pursue it for that reason. So does it work? Could mean, yes, people like it. Does evidence show that people like it? We need to find that out. The second one is reach. Are we reaching more people? So just higher numbers. Are we, are we getting out there more? Um, the third one is slightly related to that, but it's also, um, it's about reaching people, but different types of people, so equity. So maybe if you integrated, let's say you reached the same number of people, but the number of people you reached were the people that you really needed to, the most remote, the most vulnerable, the last mile, that's a value that a lot of people are pursuing, and we need evidence to show us if that happens as well. The next one is functional benefits. So uh, is it saving time? Do you get human resource boost from it, from di people having different skill sets all at once? You know, do you get something out of that? Or in the, in the opposite, does it provide, or does it have adverse effects on, on your system? Because you have to pick up the negative as well. The other one is sustainability. We need to look at do holistic programs for, for whatever reason have longer lasting effects and tend to, to stay around longer. Um, the one I think that occurred to maybe most of you when I said, you know, what does work mean is value for money and cost savings. But like Ben pointed out this morning, what if it's more expensive but you get a bigger impact? You have to make those decisions. And then the last one is, of course, impact. So by combining two or more things, did you actually get different or better results than you would have if you had done those things separately. So I think when we're starting off this conversation about what does the evidence say, it's nice to just kind of get us in that mindset of context matters, nuance is important, it's always going to be a different answer when you say does it work, depending on what is being integrated and why. Great. So Jason, I want to turn to you to talk specifically about one of the most important areas of global development. I think you can make the case across the new sustainable development goals, if there's one intervention that should be integrated for impact, I would argue it's family planning or modern contraception if you prefer that, that language. So Jason, how effective have efforts actually been to integrate family planning into broader development efforts? What does the evidence at this point in time tell us? Uh, thanks, Leith, for the, the intro, and Tricia as well, for this uh, setting the stage, because I think it helps me to talk about the evidence base. Uh, first, let me say that uh, integrating family planning into uh, broadly development interventions, uh, particularly the ones I'll be talking about, environmental interventions, is not, is not new. It's been going on for two decades, uh, and it's been supported by the Packard Foundation, by USAID in particular. And there, uh, despite these two decades of experience, there seems to continually be this call for more evidence. What's the evidence? Does it work? You know, and, and then they say, well, what is it? And does it work? Uh, so colleagues uh, of mine at Population Reference Bureau and Population Council through uh, the Evidence Project, nicely named, uh, a USAID-funded cooperative agreement uh, sought to synthesize the latest evidence on family planning and integration and explored uh, available evidence from 35 projects over the last several years. And uh, through that, I was actually surprised by the findings, uh, despite working on this for a really long time. And I was surprised uh, in two ways. First, I was surprised at, at how much actual evidence there is. Uh, there's a rich body of evidence on the first aspects that you mentioned uh, in terms of evidence on uh, satisfaction, on reach, <clears throat> and on equity. And let me just say a little bit about those. Uh, one is that uh, there was great evidence that integrating family planning with other interventions does result in an increase in contraceptive prevalence rates, or the percentage of women who are using a modern method of, of contraception. So we found across. Uh, almost all of these projects evidence of, of that success, which in itself is a marker of uh, effectiveness. Uh, so where that evidence actually is uh, really leaning towards is that these programs are quite effective in reaching those that are hardest to reach. So in equity principles. So the programs, they work, uh, that, are, that are bringing in as family planning, and they work at reaching those people who are hardest to reach. And I'll bring up an example from Madagascar in which uh, Blue Ventures, a conservation organization, listened to the people in the remote coastal villages in which they were working uh, 
uh, and listened to uh, what they wanted in terms of health services and began to integrate family planning into their um, conservation and environment projects. And over a seven year period saw contraceptive prevalence rates rise from less than 10% to over 50%. Wow. And that's, uh, that's a remarkable achievement in an area where essentially it was very, very little access. On the environmental side, we've also seen great success around the integration of family planning and, and cook stoves, uh, both interventions that uh, women tend to have control over and have desire to improve their reproductive lives, also improve, improve their, the domain in which they control, which is the health of the household in terms of smoke in the, in the, in the home. And in uh, two projects, one in uh, Nepal called the RIMS project, another in, uh, in India managed by WWF, saw an, uh, an increase in the uptake of clean cook stoves and a reduction in more than 50% of the household uh, wood use. So a real impact there in terms of uh, a, uh, both a family planning impact that was also seen there, but also an environmental impact. Let me just quickly say what I'm, the second bit, which is what I'm, um, the second surprise that, uh, that I had, which was how little we still don't know. And this really comes uh, down to the second set of um, what I would call sort of bodies or types of evidence <clears throat> that we were seeking. And that's really in terms of the, the functionality, uh, the sustainability. Uh, is it be does it work better than doing these programs in silos? And I think there, uh, I was really surprised at how few organizations are stretching the boundaries of the data collection tools that we have uh, that are looking for those unseen benefits, whether it's cost effectiveness, it's efficiencies uh, among staffing, uh, whether or not you save people time by not visiting their village you know, two, three times over different interventions, and all of which might be working with the same women's group. Mm -hmm. These things are largely unmeasured. Uh, they're unmeasured because sometimes the data are hard to, harder to collect. They fall outside of our traditional household survey instruments or their impacts that are at a landscape level, and we're used to measuring impacts at a household level or they require us to measure things within our own organizations that often in terms of cost and efficiency, we don't tend to do because we're so focused on measuring impact. Mm -hmm. And so those were the two surprises uh, that I th still think that um, you know, in terms of mm -hmm. evidence base and where we need to go, where we need to push our limits on integration. Thanks, thanks Jason. Melissa, I want to come to you. Um, certainly one of the most impressive pieces of evidence that I've seen on integration is the evaluation of a program that many of you may know called the Poverty Graduation Program. If you don't, after this conversation, you will be um, Googling to find um, the many uh, evaluations. Melissa, tell us about this program and the results, which have now been replicated actually in several different countries at scale. Yes, thank you so much. Um, just to, for me to scan a bit the audience, how many of you are familiar with the graduation approach? If you just quickly raise your hands. Okay, good, so I'll still explain. <laughs> um, so the graduation approach is, um, as we all know, poverty is multidimensional, and so it requires a very pluralized sectoral approach. And so the graduation approach, which was um, pioneered by BRAC in Bangladesh, is one such approach. It's a holistic approach that combines different elements of livelihood interventions, as we know it, social protection, and also of access to financial services. And so it is an approach that has um, a sequential, um, let's say, intervention. It is a sequential intervention, which um, includes, for instance, providing a bit of a buffer to um, poor households, extreme poor households, also providing um, services such as health, education, providing access to financial services. As we all know, it is something that is very essential for these very poor families, but also providing some technical skills, um, building some technical skills, as well as a bit of a coaching of these different households. And so as we, think, as we discuss integration today, um, I can't think of anything much, uh, what comes to mind is really the graduation approach as something that is very holistic, combining all these different elements I mentioned before. 
And one thing that Jason mentioned, which is the idea of cost effectiveness, and it is something that is very essential. As we are looking in this today, we're looking at how to reach extreme poor households. We have these different goals, whether it is the UN, the Sustainable Development Goals today, and also, or the World Bank Goals, a bit more closer to my institution. Um, so really looking at how to end extreme poverty today and how to really boost share prosperity. And really, there are different elements, elements of sustainability, elements of cost effectiveness, how to reach the greater number of people, perhaps with limited funding or limited um, capacities, but really essential is how to reach these very poor households, a lot of times who are living in very isolated areas. Um, Thank you, Melissa. I'm going to do another round of questions and then we're going to probably leave a little bit more time than usual uh, to hear from you because I'm sure there's a lot of expertise in this room uh, in terms of integration. So Tricia, back to you and I want you to give us your big takeout. You wrote an excellent blog with the title, It Depends. I think it's on the FHI 360 website. You probably all have the link. But I'm going to ask you the question anyway because I think we can all benefit from the analysis that you've done. What is your big takeout? Are you optimistic that we have enough evidence right now to justify really rapid expansion of integrated approaches across those 17 areas of the Sustainable Development Goals? So my take on this continues to evolve. Um, I would say if you asked me that a year ago, I would have said I was mildly optimistic. Um, I think since then it has transition to being a little bit more cautiously optimistic, and today it's sort of cautious slash excited optimistic. Um, and the reason is that we spent, with a couple colleagues that I actually have in the room in the back, um, we spent the last year doing a massive literature search trying to identify all the impact evaluations that have been done on development interventions that crossed our conventional sectors. And we went into it, our, we, we planned for maybe a couple of months because our assumption was that we would maybe find 50 to 100 and we ended up finding over 550. So we were sort of shocked by that, but in a good way. Mm -hmm. We didn't realize that there really had been already so much. We of course started with the acknowledgement that integration wasn't new, but that really solidified that notion that this isn't new. Mm -hmm. There can't be 550 impact evaluations on multi-sector programs if this was new. Those don't just you know, take a, a year to finish. So I'm, I'm cautious slash excitedly optimistic for a couple reasons. One, because of the uh, quantity of the evidence base that we have to work with. The second is that it's very broad. So it's not just that a couple different types of interventions are being studied over and over. There's actually a huge breadth of diversity in the 550 um, studies that we found. There's lots and lots and lots of different models and innovations being tested and tried out, which I think is, is important. But that said, that also comes with the flip side of that is that because it is so broad right now, it actually is also shallow. It's not very deep. Mm -hmm. So when we look for the answer to does it work on some of the specific ones that we have you know, evidence for, there might be a handful of studies. There are very few that have, I think, enough evidence to justify rapid expansion. Mm -hmm. So what I think we have is enough to justify a couple of things. One, rapid expansion of trying it. So keep innovating, keep trying these models, but with more rigorous evaluation, particularly on the how, and I think that was something some folks brought up again this morning. We don't necessarily at this point need a whole lot more on the why. There's a lot of information mm -hmm. and data out there now about the linkages and how challenges and opportunities are linked. We need information on implementation and, and um, how we do things in the right way. So we need a lot of implementation science. So the, the reason I wrote a blog called It Depends was sort of how I started off my um, remarks about the question is it does depend. I do think that for a handful of um, specific types of interventions, we have some promising evidence that it works and we should be using those results to do things like scale up and expansion and replication. Mm -hmm. But where there are still gaps, we need to invest resources and prioritize those gaps where, um, where they remain. Right, thank you, that's very clear. Jason, you're a measurement person. So I want you to share your very candid comments with this audience on the state of measurement of integration. Can you give us the good news and the bad? Well, I'll, uh, I'll couch my terms in the 
in the silo with um, the silo of integration within which I work, because I work specifically or have worked on, you know, a set of projects called population health environment projects, uh, and I think, uh, in terms of speaking of the evidence, I'll speak to that point and those that set of projects. I think uh, similarly, I'm cautiously opt optimistic. I think uh, there's plenty of evidence to show that these projects have equal impact um, as siloed projects. So they work as well. So there is not a loss of efficiency or effectiveness as, um, as these projects are implemented. So from a sector perspective, I feel confident in talking to donors from a particular sector and saying, you will get impact from this intervention. Uh, what is uh, more challenging is to measure the unknown right now. Sort of what are the, the ripple effects of, of integrating family planning into, uh, mm -hmm. into interventions? Why should someone who cares about nutrition, a donor in nutrition, uh, an environmental donor, uh, livelihoods, education, thinking about girls' education, mm -hmm. why should they care? Will they get those impacts or sort of spillover? And I think that's where uh, there is lef less evidence. There is some, but we re really need to continue to push the boundaries. And pushing the boundaries simply means bringing the best practices and measurement from one field uh, to another. So if you go out there and you develop a household survey and you're hoping to integrate microfinance and family planning, make sure you're asking the right questions about income, livelihoods, wealth at a household level. Because what I've found is that many times the household surveys, they don't include the right questions to answer what we don't know in terms of impacts. And I'll say that uh, colleagues of mine at Population, evidence, uh, at Population Reference Bureau through the Evidence Project have sort of followed up on this synthesis and are going to two different projects. One, in, the one I already mentioned, Blue Ventures in Madagascar, along with an integrated project uh, that it brings together Pathfinder International and the Nature Conservancy, an unlikely mm. coupling in, uh, in an area, a remote area of Tanzania. These two projects are coming together to learn from one another. They're together looking at their household surveys and they're identifying what questions they might ask jointly so that they're commonly asking questions that'll get at uh, food security, livelihood, resilience, and climate adaptation impacts of integrating family planning into these existing uh, conservation and development projects. And so uh, while we don't have measurement or quantifiable evidence around that, the hope is to take the tools, best tools that each field is developing, already has tested, and make sure that they're, that they're brought together at a household level and that they're measured over time and, and so that you can follow up and answer those mm -hmm. questions. We're not there yet, mm -hmm. but I'm optimistic that uh, over the next several years, this next wave of evidence will, will take us further. Right. Great. Melissa, the World Bank, which houses your group, mm -hmm. is clearly a critical player in global development. I read in Ben's book, he described the World Bank as the Walmart of global development and the rest of us were just corner shops. <laughs> um, if that's the case, um, the World Bank can be very, very influential in integrated development. And Jim Kim, actually, the president of the World Bank, wrote an extraordinary piece in 2013 with Paul Farmer and Michael Porter called Reimagining Global, uh, Redefining Global Healthcare Delivery, where he says, and I want to quote because it's pretty significant when you have a leader at that level, uh, such a strong advocate for integration, and uh, the authors say, the current fragmented approach in healthcare is costing us dearly in terms of duplication, inefficiency, poor use of human resources, and high procurement costs and is costing patients most of all, as they are dying of preventable diseases and suffering without therapies readily available elsewhere. That's a fairly strong statement uh, from Jim Kim uh, et al. So, Melissa, a tough question for you. If the World Bank could take just one action to truly expand models like the graduation program, what should the bank be doing? Thank you, that's a very tough question indeed. <laughs> Um, 
I think what's, it really speaks, what Mr. Kima said, it really speaks to the core of what we're discussing today, which is integration, and the need to move from more of a silo approach to more of an ecosystem and systemic um, approach, if I can put it this way. Um, I think it's important as we discuss, again, just going back a bit to, to integration in general and, and a bit of how the graduation sort of tackles it, is understanding that today we're facing many different challenges. Under, for instance, if I can speak of the climate change issues, um, also other challenges such as the refugee crisis today, and seeing how we can take from elements from different models or different approaches and sort of combine them and really having in mind the goal to, to really reach a lot of different households. And so as we talk about health or so, and it's interesting how in the graduation approach, how health is really linked into it, access to health services, because too often the health services, sometimes they are there in, within the particular communities, but households don't have access to them. And so it's really providing this sort of a bridge and providing helping these households to have access to these different services is really essential. The same for, for, for instance, financial services. I think these are really, really important and fundamental questions. And perhaps we can further discuss, um, maybe during the q and I'd be really um, happy to hear more about your questions. So one more question of our panellists before we turn to you. And I want to give Tricia and Jason an opportunity to answer this question too. Tricia, you work for one of the largest international NGOs. Uh, clearly, FHI 360 is influential here. Can you comment on how much support you have from your donors and your leadership? Clearly, your leadership is invested. We've heard from Patrick. Um, but the board and the donors of FHI 360, what level of support is there for integrated development? And Jason, you're hosted by the UN Foundation, which is a creature of the United Nations and its vast uh, network of agencies. What signs, signals are you hearing uh, from your uh, host organisation as well as your donors, that they would be willing to invest more in integration? Maybe you first, Tricia. Sure, I mean, I, I think it's evident that our leadership is fully behind this. We're here today, we're hosting this. We have an integrated development a, initiative and team, and we are quite serious about, about exploring this. So it's, it's really nice to have that strong core from our, from our own organization. But in terms of our funders, I mean, I think that they've been highly um, encouraged by this, and I think that they're asking us the right really hard questions, which we don't always have the answers to, but that together we do need to figure out if we're going to get it right. So one of the things I, I want to tip my hat to some of our funders, because I do think that in some of these conversations, there's a little bit of an unfair cop-out that INGOs can give, which is, well, of course we would be doing all of that together in an integrated way, but our, our, our funding doesn't come in that way, mm -hmm. which isn't entirely fair to lay all of the, the fault and the blame on, mm -hmm. on one party. Um, it's just, it's not. So I think that, you know, there are funders who really are interested in advancing this, but it's not easy. If it was easy, we'd been doing it a long time ago mm -hmm. and getting it right already. So when we wanted to know internally what we were already doing in terms of integration. We did an inventory and scanned all of our projects. We have thousands, as you can imagine. And we had um, around 70 that were very clearly multi-sector integrated programs. And I would say the majority of those are funded by USAID. Mm -hmm. So clearly, they're our largest mm -hmm. funder. There are many folks in the room's largest funder. They are in the room. I mean, I think that's indicative of, of a clear willingness and commitment to try out integration when they're already funding plenty of mm -hmm. integrated programs. Mm -hmm. And I think that they're very invested in continuing to do that. But again, asking complicated questions along the way to make sure we're doing it right. And then from day one, in terms of our own integrated development initiative, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has been a huge supporter and champion of the work, and we've been very grateful for that. Internally, they have their own integrated delivery team, and so we've got a nice symbiotic relationship with that team where neither of us has all the answers worked out, but we're trying to learn from, from what each of the different institutions is doing, and then they've, you know, they've funded some of the work that we're doing around evidence synthesis. So I think that it's, um, it's nice to know that, again, one of the biggest players in the funding world is, is, is moving in that direction mm -hmm. as well. Great. Jason. Let me just briefly step back and say something about Family Planning 2020, which I'm representing today. FP 2020 is a, a multi-donor uh, initiative, a multi-stakeholder um, initiative that basically brings together the family planning community to look forward to 2020 with an ambitious goal of uh, reaching 120 million additional women with access to family planning. There are currently around 225 
uh, uh, 225 uh, million women who would like to delay pregnancy who aren't using a modern method. So trying to close that gap um, in the near term. And I, in terms of the donors who are active in this, uh, USAID, the Gates Foundation, we've heard about those already, UNFPA. <clears throat> um, I'm leaving one out. Help me here, Tricia. It's a USA whoa, Gates oh, Foundation and Diffid. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Diffid. <laughs> on the live stream. Sorry, they are. <laughs> they are really committed to not only uh, reaching those people who are the easiest. If you want to reach 120 million additional women, you know, you go to the biggest cities, mm -hmm. right? And these are in the 69 poorest countries. Let me add that. They are really committed to an equitable approach as well, reaching those hardest to reach that I mentioned. And they're, they know that that's going to take different approaches. Business as usual does not work when people are beyond the traditional means of service delivery, public sector. So how do you reach them? You need innovative approaches, and most often what I'm finding is you need integrated approaches. Because it's already hard to get there, you might as well start piggybacking in terms of, of getting there. And I, um, I think you know, FP2020 is committed to that, and that um, certainly suggests that those who are supporting that, um, that initiative are on board. Thank you. Now over to you. You've been very, very patient. So feel free to ask questions of any of the individual panelists. Just I would ask that you, when you, when you uh, ask the questions, you can raise your hand. I'll call on you. Just state your name and the organization you represent. We are, are trying to build a community here, which means we have to be very honest and candid with each other. It's a safe space. We know this is not an issue without controversy. So please feel free to be honest and candid in your comments. We want to achieve a level of uh, honesty in this discussion so we can move this, um, this agenda forward. So with that, who would like to ask the first question? Yes. Hi, I'm Cindy clapp -Winsack. These days I'm an independent consultant and I am doing some work with FHI 360 on their evaluation work. Um, I noticed uh, Tony Pippa and some of the colleagues here on the panel, we keep using the word measurement and therefore my question is, is evidence only quantitative? I think back to the kinds of things that Ben said and the, those types of issues wouldn't have def led me necessarily into just the straight quantitative answer. Measurement. Who wants to take that? Trisha? I'll take the first step and I'd love to know what Jason and Melissa think as well. I mean, absolutely not. No. I think you probably already knew that, Cindy, but I think it's really good to get out in the open because I do think oftentimes we do jump to and default to the numbers and it's the numbers game and it's quantitative. Did you do more X? Did you get you know higher numbers of this? Did uptake go up? Did this increase? Mm -hmm. But I think in some of the benefits in my list of seven, that were, that were at the front end, they require the qualitative methods. They require talking to people and getting opinions, maybe even as Laura mentioned, some social anthropology to find out how people feel about those. So if you want to know if someone's satisfied, that's not necessarily, you don't have to do that in a quantitative way. If you need to know, you know, the quality of your services that you're providing, you don't need the quantitative aspects. To do some, you know, impact evaluations, and I think some particular types of funders and decision makers want that, but I, I think that there's probably just as many who do want the, the other side of the coin, and I think we do need to use more qualitative methods to get us there to understand processes and the other layers of things that you can't get just from reading the data and the numbers and the results. Tracy? Uh, I absolutely agree, and I, uh, probably being a demographer, I tend to lean towards the quantitative when I'm talking, but if you read what we wrote, <laughs> which allows me to slow down and think about it more, uh, and this, this report is available through the Evidence Project on the synthesis of, of population health environment programs, very much focus on the, um, the importance of combining quantitative and qualitative to measure some of the more difficult aspects of programs uh, in terms of functionality. You know, when you have 10 staff who are working on an initiative, they're you know, surveying 10 people on your staff and providing a percentage of staff who are satisfied with the approach is not that compelling. But getting deep stories about efficiencies, about what worked and what didn't from your own staff in terms of these projects, 
critical. And the same at the community level. You know, did they save time? I mean, doing, doing time, um, there are quantitative ways of measuring that, but tend to be better to do it qualitatively. There's some great ways, ways to measure um, time use in the household. And I think qualitative measures are a key aspect of this. Need to be combined with the quantitative to overall show uh, the impact of these programs and uh, initiatives. Next question. Yes, few, Melissa. Just a few things. So I think it's, as Jason mentioned, I think it's very essential to have a mix. When you're measuring different um, programs, um, it's really important to have this mix of the quantitative and the qualitative methodologies. Um, perhaps more of you who are familiar with the graduation approach are familiar with the six RCTs that came out um, from the studies by IPA and JPAL. Um, but also, there's also, it's important to know that um, in other sites that were not evaluated by the, uh, with the RCTs, there were also qualitative um, research that was done. And I think that it's important to remember that there's a lot of nuances that cannot be captured by perhaps the quantitative analysis. It needs to be ca captured by the qualitative um, research. And I think it's important to have this, this very balanced approach when we're talking about measurement to be able to capture, to have a very 360 um, view of the different issues that households are facing. Can I give a very fast example? Yes, yeah. Um, so in, in full transparency, I'm not a researcher. I work in research utilization and I support a lot of researchers. And several years ago, I worked on a team of one of FHI 360's brilliant researchers, Teresa Hoke, I hope she's watching on the live stream, um, looking at whether an intervention to combine family planning and HIV in South Africa, quote unquote, worked, which in that scenario meant an uptake of family planning methods for postpartum women coming out of um, prevention of mother to child um, transmission programs. And the, the quantitative methods showed that no, it did not work. The numbers actually went down. It had the opposite of a, uh, effect of what it had intended to do. But without combining that with qualitative methods from the very beginning, we would never have known why. So I think that's another key of doing oh. mixed methods. So you can have the quantitative that show you objectively, yes, this worked, no, it didn't. If you have the qualitative, you can figure out that's why. Great point. Great we learned point. a million things went wrong in the implementation. There was a city strike. All of these things happened that were completely unanticipated. They didn't actually have much to do with the model itself. So even though it failed, we learned that it, it's probably worth trying again somewhere else in a different setting. So we understood that, and we wouldn't have if we hadn't combined the mixed brilliant, methods brilliant of both. Point. That's a great point. Next question. I'm going right to the back, the lady at the back. Yes. I'd like to take that. I could take a stab. Um, I think one of the best practices that, uh, that we've identified in terms of these integrated programs, and those that have worked, those that have really struggled, are those that, um, that have thoughtfully designed, and there's the design word over there on the wall, design that integration from, from the beginning and thought through conceptually together as teams, as, as multiple institutions, um, their desired impact, or impacts probably, and how they're connected and the ways in which they are connected, and then devised um, joint and integrated interventions based on that common uh, framework. People have called it conceptual framework, results frame, you know, just lots of different words for it, but some sort of theory of change from the outset. That, 
often does not happen because the interventions are staggered. You start with one thing and then you decide to bring in another. At some point, you have to pause. And you have to, I mean, I think teams have to ask themselves, why are we doing this? And, and what do we hope to achieve? And so that's uh, one thing that I'm, I know colleagues in the room that are here have worked on those and, and could probably speak to that uh, in, in future discussions. We do have a session this afternoon as well on the management of integration, and I think you'll enjoy some of the, the comments on that. Other questions? Yes, this lady right here, yes. Thank you. I'm Laura Hemicky from IntraHealth International. Um, I think one, we've been talking a lot about sort of the, diff, the need for different donors to come together implementing agencies, but haven't heard as much about local country ownership, the fact that some of these integrated approaches uh, require you know, support of the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Local Government. Um, and ultimately, my hypothesis would be that uh, to be effective, an integrated approach really takes longer often than a three or five year project cycle. So do any of you have experiences in how that's been effective in the long term? Because we can sometimes measure results in six months, like the intervention you described in, in South Africa, but sometimes you may need to wait three years. And kind of what and how do you ensure ongoing stakeholder support and engagement? Because I think it does take more time if it's really a systems-based approach. Thanks. Good question. Does integration take more time? Do you need more time? Yes. <laughs> it does. Um, I'll just add a few things. Um, I think it's, it's, it's interesting, as you were saying, that you know, you're know you moving from one point to the other, where, for instance, you'll need perhaps more um, input from governments. And, um, and, and for instance, I'm, I'll just go back to revert a bit to, to what I know a bit more. Um, so the graduation approach, for instance, how, as just one example of an integrated program, how it's, um, so it first started, you had the, the pioneer with the BRAC, and then afterwards, pilot tested by CGAP and the Ford Foundation. And then now what we're moving into, it's this new phase where you have governments and you have large donors that are interested in helping replicating this model at a larger scale. So it's interesting to see the different changes that are happening as government and other stakeholders are coming to the table. It's, it's, you know, you have different ministries at the governmental level that are being um, sort of providing more input. You have the Ministry of Finance that are providing some input. You have the Ministry of Social Affairs. You have other ministries, whether it's the environment or so. And initially, if we thought that maybe it's just simply, it could be housed at the Ministry of Social Affairs, we're really realizing that other ministries have much more input to provide. And it's through this sort of consolidation and, and harmonization of different efforts that we can really reach the goal that we have set for ourselves, which is really reaching more households. So it's really important to not, um, I'd say, minimize a bit the role of different stakeholders. Yeah. Fisher, did you want to add? Yeah, I would agree. I would say I think it does, in, in most cases, take longer. That's an aside. But to your question on the sort of multi-stakeholder engagement and does that have, you know, a relationship to, to how it rolls out and what happens, it absolutely does. And that's why I think in a conversation about evidence, you know, it, it's easy for some um, stakeholders, especially research-oriented ones, to, to assume that once you have the evidence everyone's been seeking, this automatically all starts to happen, but it definitely doesn't. I mean, we have plenty of underutilized evidence-based interventions in development, and this is certainly no different. And so in my experience with particularly some health-health integrated interventions that are deeply evidence-based, we didn't get a lot of traction in some countries where the, the national governments and the ministries either weren't convinced or they just weren't interested or they didn't really have the political will to make those bridges between the different units. And where they did, it, it took off immediately and it has sustained for many years in some of the countries that really had, again, the political will to make sure the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Health were all working together. They all saw the incentives from their own perspectives and they made it happen. I will say it wouldn't have happened though without the evidence first. Mm -hmm. So we had to have the proof of concept to say, you know, this is working, a little bit of scale up, it's continuing to work, this is very promising. And it was enough then to convince them to do this hard kind of government level change that's required to make some of this actually happen. Other questions? I'm looking for a gentleman. We've only had women raise their hands. That's quite unusual. It's gender balance. I'd like a gender balance in the questions. Does anyone have a burning question? Who is? <laughs> okay, ladies. 
<laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Natasha Sokolsky, and I'm with PACT, formerly with FHI 360. Um, and in the spirit of safe space and building community, I'd just like to share some of my thinking and my dissatisfaction in the moment and my um, pondering. I'm wondering if we do ourselves a disservice when we try to conceptualize integrated development within the confines, or integrated development within the confines of development as we know it now, rather than widening that lens back further and further and further. I'm missing a little bit of excitement around integrated development in this room today, and for me, what's exciting about it is it's the opportunity to really address root causes, right? To really address why there's poor health, why there's abuse or misuse of natural resources. And you do that by addressing poverty. You do that by addressing inequity in power at the societal level, globally, locally. And so when we talk about is there proof, I can't help to wonder if the proof is in the success of movements that tap into the powers of the power of communities to affect change. And that's the evidence base that we're looking for. Great question. I will partially address that in the next 15 minute session. We have a tool that is a baby step towards that, Natasha. It's not a big step, it's a little toe in the water, but it, it will speak to that. But I don't know if the other panelists have feelings. So we can take a comments and then one more question, then we are going to hear more from Tricia. But any response? That was a great question, by the way. And there is a lack of I feel it too, there is a lack of excitement. Is the development community fatigued? I mean, we're at the beginning of 15 years of the most ambitious goals the world has ever imagined. If we are not excited, <laughs> and if we are not using new frameworks, I am very, very nervous. Yeah. Well, I, my <laughs> as a measurement per as a measurement You could be exciting too, Jason. <laughs> I can be exciting. I'm, I'm daunt I actually, I find the, the SDGs daunting more daunting. Than, um, than creating excitement because <laughs> There are 17 of them, but when you dive deeper, there are 169. Thank you. I was going to say 140, so more. 169 things to measure. <clears throat> and I certainly don't believe that we should be excited to integrate all of those. <laughs> so there, again, are there movements that we can create around certain aspects of development that ought to be linked, in which there's just no doubt that these things ought to be brought together, particularly around women's health. I think there are obvious, obvious opportunities there. Women's health, girls' education, they're so interlinked. Mm. And there are existing movements. And you know, those of you who probably went to Women Deliver are, are hearing that, but then the how, how to do it, and becoming excited when you know, we've been waving the flag on these issues for a long time and saying they're integrated, and yet haven't really gained traction, I think, is I find um, still daunting. I'm with you uh, in terms of um, feeling that need, but I'm not sure what the steps are towards it, towards it. And I'm not sure that the SDGs provide us with an obvious path to that excitement. Melissa, did you want to give a quick comment on? Yes, I think it's, um, it's really, that's a very interesting question, really. Thank you. Um, I, I feel a bit, I guess a bit down to that as well, because um, the, the challenges are so, are so great. And, but I feel also it's really important to sort of tap into the existing potential and the resources that, that are already there and really finding a way to leverage those existing resources. And I think, for instance, communities, or I mean, there's tremendous, uh, I think, promise within communities. We just need to, to sort of really tap into their potential, tap into their existing capabilities, and really boost them. Um, but it's, it's, it is a bit daunting when you look at the SDGs, I, it is. But that, that's a bit, if we're talking about integration, that, that's, that taps at the core of it. We need to have this, this sort of pulling in of different resources, pulling in of different um, existing knowledge and, and really see how this sort of this pool of all this knowledge, technique, I mean technical um, assistance or technical knowledge or so, can be leveraged to, to really reach the goals that we're setting for ourselves, so. Okay, well if you're feeling daunted, Trisha's going to help you out, because oh, what, no. we're, what we're going to do now is, I'd like you to thank uh, Jason and Melissa,